of Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join us. Check out our program, check out our viral worship, check out our church in general. There are a lot of great things happening at Shiloh. Please go to our website and see some of the great activities that we are doing here uh, in our area. Some of the things that we are doing to reach people for Christ. We are a kingdom church who believes in kingdom building, who is helping to change people's lives. Check out the message today. Go to our website. Check out our other messages. We are so glad to make you a friend of Shiloh Baptist Church. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessing. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? To him who is our crucified, buried, but risen and resurrected Savior, I say praise the Lord. Unto all of you that are sitting in your house for a word, grab your tablets, grab your Bibles. Let's go and see what the Lord will say to us today. There's a very uh, strong uh, impression 
uh, in here from the Holy Spirit that God's about to do something. Uh, you only, there's only a few of us in here that believe it, but we feel it. But God is about to do something. Uh, can you go with me uh, into the book of Habakkuk, the Old Testament book? It is the eighth book in the position of the 12 minor prophets. It is the prophet Habakkuk. It's a powerful book, and I'm going to read just a few verses uh, that will set the tone for the word that God's going to speak today. Habakkuk chapter 3, small book, only three chapters, but there is power in those three chapters. When you have it, say amen. I will actually time in my hearing a virtual amen. 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 All right, that was a good one. He just gave me one. Folk here gave me one, so I had the time. Go with me to chapter 3. We begin at verse 17. Very familiar passage that we're going to ask God to blow some fresh anointing on and knock the dust off and build it back up in our hearts. Verse 17 of chapter 3 in the book of Habakkuk says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stars. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me walk upon my high places and upon the high places. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer and praise that God may bless us as I give you the title of today's message. Father God, I thank you. Lord, that was a pause because I want everyone to interject what they're thankful for. Our, our frontline folk that are in hospitals and the unnamed workers or heroes that are getting sick and still going back to work to those who are standing in the gap, not only physically, but spiritually praying for families. Lord, we may not be able to gather physically in big crowds, but Lord, we believe that our lives are in your hands. So God, today, bless this word that someone who is sitting there, it'll be the need. It'll be like an oasis in the desert. It'll be fresh water supplied to someone's soul that they may go on just a little while longer. So Lord, we ask you to come now and breathe, breathe on me, God. Let me not get in the way of what you want to do. Take me out of the way and allow your spirit to come and bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to throw my, oh, you got up there. So I want you to, I would say no and repeat this after me, but y'all sit down, y'all three, four people sit down. We're going to go right into the word of God. Here's the title. We're going to speak from this thought as long as the spirit of God will lead, even if, dot, 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 he got you. Even if he got you. The Lord has your back. Somebody say that with me. Even if. God's got, me. God's got me. A woman goes to her pastor and says that there is something that's not quite right about my marriage. As a matter of fact, uh, we may be headed toward divorce. The pastor looked at her and said, okay, she seems sincere. He said, well, uh, let me ask you a few questions so I can get a feel for what you're going through. So right in the middle, the pastor started out and he said, well, do you think your husband is having an affair. The woman said, no, he's not having an affair. When he goes out, he leaves the house, he calls back, tells me he loves me, checks on me with very genuine uh, sincerity. When he goes, he brings me flowers, he brings gifts back. No, he ain't got no other woman. I'm enough woman for him. Then the pastor said, okay, well, is he lazy and won't go to work? She said, no. He's got a great job. In fact, he gets accommodations at his job for not missing any time on work. All the bills are paid. He is a great provider. The pastor said, hmm. Well, then is, he must be a bad father. No. When I leave the house, I know my kids are fine. Matter of fact, he told me, take your time. You ain't got to hurry back. I got the kids. I got this. And when I get back, the kids would rather be with him than me. The pastor said, well, there's only one thing left. And I didn't want to go there, but... Is he abusing you? 
does he hit you? Woman said, he ain't never laid a hand on me. Matter of fact, he respects me. He hasn't hit me or the kids. So the pastor puzzled said, well, let me get this straight. He isn't having an affair. Um, he goes to work. He's a good provider. Uh, he takes care of you and the kids, and the kids want to be with him more than you. Um, and he hasn't ever laid a hand on you. He respects you. So like you got a pretty good marriage. What is the problem? And the woman said, uh, now that you put it like that, uh, I, think I, gotta, I think my marriage is better than I thought it was. The problems I'm thinking of are little teeny problems, and I know we can work those out. See, Pastor, sorry for wasting your time. When the woman left, the pastor said, what I'm about to say to you, that woman got a problem. She got a problem that affects a lot of people, come on, go with me, and affects a lot of Christians and believers, and that problem is especially in this time of pandemic. She is a disillusioned person who has forgotten has forgotten to concentrate and focus on the right stuff. Here it is. She has forgotten and she is representative of all of you out there somehow that has forgotten who your God is and you rather focus on what's going wrong or what might happen instead of thanking God and celebrating for what he's already done. Some of y'all out there got a whole lot to celebrate for right now. Some of you out there listening to me, you would move directly into a position of joy if you believe the statement I just said. And that is that when you are a child of God, yeah, yeah. please get this. God wants me to put this in your spirit today. God wants every believer to get this in the spirit today. If you're going to be an overcomer, if you're going to be able to handle the stuff you're facing, if you're going to get beyond the complaining and the humdrum life, and when is stuff going to be over? God wants me to place this in your spirit. Are you ready? Here it is. If you are a child of God, your situation is never as bad as it seems. I wish I had somebody know what I'm talking about. Somebody just moved in to understand, hey, I got to face that. Even though I'm focusing and practicing on what's wrong, because I got God, I got a whole lot of backup in behind me. I got a whole lot of power watching over me. I got a whole lot of God taking care of me. And that is the problem. There are too many of us that have found ourselves being taken down that road of complaining instead of understanding what God wants us to have. What I'm trying to tell you as a true child of God, you don't have to worry because God is on your side. Now, wait a minute. I got I to gotta preface this and I got to back this up with something. Don't act like, don't try to accuse me of being one of those preachers who says because you have God on your side and the favor of the Lord, nothing can happen to you bad. That's not true. Matter of fact, that's not true and it's not even scripturally correct. And secondly, I have never heard of a real child of God. If you're out there, please write me, call me, let me know that has done anything for the Lord and has not had to overcome some situations in their life. As a matter of fact, all the overcomers wave their hand to let somebody know. I didn't just get here sitting around not trusting God. Oh, come on. I told you, I know you're sitting in your living room, but right now you ought to let somebody know. I've been through some stuff. I done had to pray at night. I've had some days when I didn't know whether I was coming or going. But thanks be to God, he was on my side. And today, I want you to know you are in good company. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, go there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Apostle Paul said this, and he said unto me, my grace. You know Paul was complaining to God because he had a thorn in his flesh. And God said, as a matter of fact, he complained three times. But 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 said this. God came to him and said, wait a minute. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength, I got some good news, is made perfect in your weakness. If you're weak, God is strong. Here's what he said. He says, most gladly, therefore, I will rejoice in my infirmities. I wish I could give somebody a 30-second praise break right there. Stuff going on in your life. Problems with your children. Problems in your mind. Problems on your job. I dare you to take a 30-minute praise break and say, if I rejoice, it's because my God is sufficient. You heard David in Psalms 34, 19 said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but my God will deliver us out of them all. You all let somebody know, and I'm proof of that. Because I've been in some stuff, but he delivered me out of them all. Or Peter. I'm talking about knife carrying Peter before the cross. 
But then miracle working Peter after the cross. You know how he got from being knife carrying Peter to miracle working Peter? He went through some times when his mind was going, when he was low, when he was guilty, when he was, when he was messed up and he had to go through some valleys of darkness. But Peter even said this to somebody who's sitting out there trying to blame God and you walking around talking about, I don't know why I'm going through this. He said in uh, second, first Peter 4 and 12, write it down. First Peter 4 verses 12 and 13, it says this. Um, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that should try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Unbelievers don't know what God is doing in this time. And I'm not an expert to sit here and tell you I know. But here's what I know. God been preparing me for stuff. Yeah. He's been preparing me to hold on no matter what's going on. So he said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that should try you. Can I zero in on you? Why do you think it's strange? Because you're going through. There's somebody else that's been through the same stuff you're going through. All you got to do, he said, you need to rejoice because we are partakers of Christ's suffering. I have never seen anybody because of God's favor who has not trouble. I had a lady write me and said, uh, just said Pastor, um, I know, she had a question. I know that um, because well, we're on God's side and Psalms 91 say that no plague shall come nigh our dwelling. I know we can't get the virus. I say, eh, wrong, wrong. That is not true. What makes you think you're not supposed to get the virus? One of the biggest misconceptions, and here's how foolish people are acting. No, the foolishness is not that we got to worry about getting it. We got to know we got a God that can handle it even if we do get it. Is somebody with me? God never promised you wouldn't go through stuff. He just promised that he would get you out. Write these three things down. Here are three promises of God that you ought to know. He promised us promises that will work. He promised us deliverance that is always available. I'll say it again. He promised us promises that will work. He promised us deliverance that is always available. And he promised us that he would be a God who had more than enough power. So what am I talking about today? Please follow me. Let's go to our text. Here's what it is. I'm talking about quit being one of those Christians talking about, I don't know what's going to happen. What if? No. Here is what this message is telling us. Even if you go broke. Even if. Uh, 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 you lose your job Even if you get sick Even if you have problems Even if you lose your car Even if folk run out on you Even if things ain't working We got a God who is an even if God He don't just hold me when I ain't got nothing He has to hold me when I get it Can I get somebody to say even if Even if, even if See the problem with us is We get afraid of the if We sit around all night long in our houses Talk about if if, and God is saying, I'm an even if God. I'm a God that blesses you even if something is going wrong. And I know I got somebody out there know what I'm talking about. If you go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13 tells us this. And I love the Apostle Paul because he was in jail situations and bad situations when he said, I'm not speaking, Philippians 4, verse 11, in respect of one. No, uh, I've learned how to abound. I've learned how to be abased. I've learned how to be full and I've learned how to be hungry. I've learned that uh, it, I've learned to be content. I've learned, I've learned what he said, but I can do all things. Why? Through Christ who strengthened me. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Quit running around scared to death talking about something might happen. Don't think God is only a God who keeps you from stuff. Can I give you a hint? He keeps you in stuff. I know I got somebody just recognized it today that that's the kind of God we have. Matter of fact, I got confidence that whatever tackles me, God is greater. I wish somebody could give God a confident praise. I mean, really, come on, let the devil know. Shake the cobwebs off your praise today. Let God know. I am confident that when this dust blows over, when this mess is gone, I'm still going to be intact. I'll have my health. I'll have my strength. I'll have my provisions. Everything I need, I believe God is going to provide. How do I know that? Philippians 1 and 6. Again, I told you Paul was in a prison confinement and he wrote these words. He said, I am being confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you yeah, yeah, yeah. will finish it. He'll work on you. He's going to finish it. All I'm telling you, this text is about learning to trust God, not because everything's good, but even if things get bad. We sitting around. I know we sterilize and we sanitize and we do all that. I'm telling you, all that's cool. But please don't get scared that if stuff happened. What I'm telling you is don't be afraid of the if. Somebody say if. if. 
The devil can beat you up with a hit. You laying in your bed in fear because of it. You sit there talking about, what happens if I lose my job? What happens if I get the power? If you get it and you got God, okay, you just got it. And God is still with you. Let me tell you how if can mess you up. Because I can tell you one. Look, uh, there is one of my favorite routes that I used to walk and run. There was this big dog at, at my room. And this big dog, I was scared of him because every time I would start, I would walk by or run by, he was there and he would start growling and barking. Then he would run at me full speed and he stopped maybe about a foot, a foot and a half in front of me. Because, now watch this y'all, he had, the, the, the owner said, beware of dog, but we have an invisible fence. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> but I was scared. I want to see a fence, not just an invisible fence, but it was an invisible fence, and so that made it doubly scary. And I can recall how, no matter how much I was enjoying my walk on this beautiful sunny day, as I was approaching, knowing I had to go past that dog, all of the ifs would start. The scary bunch of ifs would start going through my mind. What if the invisible fence is broke? What if he bite me and I got to fight him? What if he bite me and I get rabies and need a tetanus shot? And because I get a tetanus shot, the tetanus shot, I get affected or I'm allergic. I start going through all these ifs. So what I used to do out of fear, I told you if will make you fear. I would run past his house. So I'd cross over on the other side of the street. He would run me off my roof. Do you know fear will run you off your roof? And I remember I decided to do something about it. I decided to conquer the if with an even if. No, I didn't. I went home and got me a big stick. Yes, I did. It was a huge stick. And I began practicing, practicing with my stick. I, I would imagine in my mind that the dog was attacked and bop, I hit him across the top of the head. And then I said when he attacked and he lounged at me, boom, catch him right up under the throat. Look, I ain't trying to be cruel to animals, but I'm trying to tell you I was not, I was ready. So after that, I began to walk by and I would use my, my stick as like a cane so I wouldn't scare the dog. And I'm walking by, I'm walking by the house, and you know what started happening? The dog was, after a while, he just looked up, laying down there, looking at me, and keep trucking. Uh, I don't know if he was scared of the stick, or he just got used to me, but nothing happened. But here's what happened to me. I started getting courage and strength, not because I was afraid of if I get bit. I was afraid that if I did get attacked, I got an even if in my hand. Come on, somebody. Even if he attacked, I was ready. You know what will give you courage to stand through anything you're going through? Is to tell yourself in your mind, I'm not worried about anything. Because if something happens, even if it comes my way, I got a God in heaven who I know is carrying a big stick. Has your God got a big stick? Let somebody know, devil, you better not come this way. He going to bop you across the head. Then he going to cut you underneath the throat. All I'm telling you is, once you get a hold of the fact that, you know what, I am covered. Yes, yes. God got my back. I am safe. What I'm saying is, you got to go with this text. I had to learn to get rid of the if. Tell, tell somebody in your house, tell them right now, don't be afraid of the if. No, you got a God of the even if. Come on, help me somebody. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. In our text, verse 18, Habakkuk had just got done running off a whole lot of stuff that would put his life in jeopardy, uh, that would make his life turn upside down, that, would, that were just horrible things. He started naming all these things that could happen. But then verse 18, after going through two chapters with God, a three-chapter book, I'm going to give you a background in a minute. We found out that about the gate, this statement in verse 18, he said, even if all this stuff happened, yeah, I will rejoice. Come on, somebody. I got any rejoicers out there because I know the joy of my God is myself. Oh, I know somebody dancing around their house right now. Touch something right now and let the Lord know. I know I can rejoice because God is on my side. Somebody say, even if it happens, I am covered. Three things right now. Quickly, three things. We're going to get out of here. But I need you to get this. This right in this text. It is powerful. Three things that will help you become an understanding Christian that God is the God of the even if. Come on. Quick word about what might happen. He is an even if. God. First thing you need is you need a revival. All by yourself. Write it down. The text tells us you need a revival. Those of you listening to me, first time, this, I like to lay it out, I'll tell you where I'm going at. The second thing this text tells us is you need a rehearsal. You need a rehearsal. And the third thing is you need to recommit. 
You need a revival. You need a rehearsal. You need to recommit to God. I'm going to say it one more time. If somebody's skeptic, just getting on with me right now. You need a revival. You need a rehearsal. You need to recommit. The book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk's name means to embrace. I love that about Habakkuk because Habakkuk is a minor prophet. I told you he occupies the eighth position of the twelve minor prophets. His contemporaries are Nahum and Zephaniah. All three of them were alive and they were prophesying in the days or the last days before the southern kingdom of, of Judah was going into captivity by the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. But what's great about Habakkuk is Habakkuk was during this time there was heathenism and idolatry and there was infidelity to God and injustice to people and Habakkuk was angry about that. But I want you to know something about Habakkuk that makes this book interesting. He didn't go around warning people. He didn't go around telling the people, you better get right. Habakkuk did something some of us do, or some of us don't have the courage to do. This book is not about him warning people. This book is Habakkuk took his burden to the Lord. Help me somebody. Here's what Habakkuk did. Habakkuk said, God, these people ain't acting right, but it's your fault. Help me somebody. Habakkuk said, this is my burden. Here's what Habakkuk said to God. He said, if you are a good God, he asked the question we like to ask. If you are a good God, why is there so much evil? Habakkuk asked God, he said, if you are such a good God and we are your chosen people, then why are you allowing all this stuff to happen to us? And we'll make it personal because Habakkuk was talking about the nation. But let me talk about you and me. Sometimes we sit around and you might not verbalize it loudly, but please stay with me. And you start saying stuff like, uh, God, I know you want to say what Habakkuk said. If you're a good God and I'm your child, how come you sitting up in heaven watching me go through this and you're not doing a thing? That's what we want to ask God. That's what we want to say to God. Let me tell you what happened. But you need to understand that Habakkuk found out two good things. I got some good news for you this morning. The first thing is, because of this book of Habakkuk, we know something. We know that God said it's okay to question me. I just blessed somebody right there. It's okay to question God. Secondly, we found out through Habakkuk, he will answer and tell you what he's doing. Now, you might not like what he's doing, but he'll still answer. All I'm telling you is you need to stay with God in good season or bad season. All I'm saying is remember this, remember this. You may not like what God is doing, but even when you're going through, you better hang close to God. Have I got a witness? You better not let your pain, you better not let no people, you better not let your circumstances tell you to let go of God's unchanging hand. You better hold on to God. You know why? Because all of us know how this thing going to work out. We know in the end it's going to be what you meant for my evil, God meant for my good. You know if you hang in there soon enough, God's going to turn this thing around. Can I get three people to say God will turn it around? Come on, shout it to me out. God get ready to turn my situation around. He is a turning around God. He will do that. All I'm saying is don't, let, don't be fooled and let go of God because things aren't right. You better hang in there because God's going to tell you what to do. Now, let me finish with the book. So the book is three chapters. The first two chapters are questions and answers. I love that. It's uh, Habakkuk questioning God and God giving him answers for his questions. So Habakkuk asked God, well, look, what are you going to do about all this evil? Chapter one. And, and God answered Habakkuk. You know what he said? He said, well, Habakkuk, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, to come in and correct my people. I'm going to let them overtake my people and then they'll start turning to me. And Habakkuk heard this. Well, he wasn't satisfied. So in these two chapters, he asked God another question. At the end of chapter 1, after his response, he goes into chapter 2. But at the end of chapter 1, he said, God, the Babylonians are worse than we are. They bow down to idols. They're not good people. Why are you going to send them to whoop us? God didn't answer. But if you go to chapter 2, a very famous scripture in the second verse of the second chapter of Habakkuk is one we know. Because in the first chapter, the first verse of the second chapter, Habakkuk said, I'm going to set myself on the wall like a watchman. And so that's where we get our watchman. What he was doing, he said, I'm going to watch and see what he will answer me. And then the second verse, God answered him. I love God. He answered. You know what he said? A scripture we all use right now. Write the vision. Make a plan. It may not come to pass now. But it will come to pass. Is that not shouting news for somebody? Here's what God said. Quit worrying about where you're at now. See a vision of me delivering you. And I will get you out of your situation. And in this second chapter, some of the most powerful verses we ever heard. The just 
shall live by faith. And there's another verse, the Lord is in his holy temple. And so we found out through all of this, God told him, I will also destroy Babylon. And there's five woes. The five woes are the woes he gives to the Babylonians. I may use you to correct my people, but you're still not my people. And so he said, I will destroy them. That's when we get to the third chapter where we are. Look at it. In this third chapter, it's Habakkuk's response to learning that God isn't even in God. It's Habakkuk's response to saying that, hey, it, it's a prayer and a song unto God. And that's what this third chapter in your Bible, it should say, the prayer of Habakkuk of Shiganoth. And Habakkuk now is giving a prayer to God because he knows now that God is an even if God. Let's look at it. Look at it. Look at it with me. It says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech. I was afraid, O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of thy years. First point, you need a revival. Here's what happened. Habakkuk said, Lord, I'm sorry I was afraid. But just like some of you people, I got some shouts in my past. I got some dances in my past. I got some miracles in my past. I got some praises in my past. But I still was afraid when I heard your voice, when I heard what was happening. God, I am sorry. Will you please, watch Habakkuk, will you please revive my spirit? Help me, somebody. It right there. Here's the problem. God is not the problem. You sitting down there with your no praise himself. You no looking up the glory self. You sitting down there with all God has done for you. You got a nerd to be sitting around complaining and you got a roof over your head and a God taking care of you. Here's what he said. You need a revival and not one that comes from church. I'm glad the church is closed. You need a revival in your house. You need to revive yourself in your kitchen. You need a revival that don't take no organ, no piano, or anything else. You need a revival that encourages you. Can I give you the secret tonight? Folk aren't going to encourage you all the time. Things may not encourage you all the time, but take a hint from David in 1 Samuel. He said, I, David, encourage himself. Sometimes you just got to walk around and say, lift up your head. You got to tell yourself, what in the world are we worried about? With the God that we serve. He said, you got to learn to encourage yourself. So you need a revival. What's a revival? He said, revive the work in me. Now, Marion uh, Webster Dictionary gives three definitions of revival. Write this down. He said, how do I revive myself? The first way you revive yourself is you revive your attention or your interest in something. It's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, when Paul said, I thank God that you turn from idols to the true and living God. He said, here's when you renew your interest because what you're doing isn't working. All I'm saying is if you're sitting there now and you've been in church all your life and you've been serving God for the last 10 years, but you're miserable and you're fearful and you don't know what's going on, then you need to check yourself and tell God, i got to renew my interest in you, God. I've been paying too much attention to my money. I've been paying too much attention to my friends. I've been paying too much attention to other things. You know, we had, we had teenagers, and when our teenagers, when our kids got to a teenage age, you know what they did? They started trusting in the words of their friends more than the words of me and their mother. And that, that's bad to me. I mean, they could tell me what Junebug said. They could tell me what Lulu said and, and what Doom Doom said. They could tell me all that, but they weren't listening to what I said. And I said, it's not right. But Lulu and Doom Doom and Junebug ain't giving you no egg and bacon in the morning. They don't give you no refrigerator. You don't live in their house. How are you listening to everybody but the one who supplies your need? I'm going somewhere. How in the world are you listening to everybody around you except for the God who supplies your need? I know God is up and said, why don't that boy listen to me? Why is that girl listening to Fox News and CBS News and everything they say about Corona? Why are they digesting that when I said, I am God and I will take care of you. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you should fear no evil because I am with you. You got to renew your interest. Nobody you can renew your interest in God. Here's the cool part. Because God's got grace. Don't look at me like that. I just saw you shit. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When God lets you renew your interest, it's because of his grace that surrounds you. You ain't all that good that he should be allowing you to renew your interest. It's because God's got grace. You know what I'm talking about? He's, he knew that you fell off your game. What am I talking about? David killed Goliath. Won battles for the Lord. 
man after God's own heart. But then he also later, after doing all that, he slept with Bathsheba. What am I trying to tell you? But David had enough sense to say, you know what, God? These idols ain't working. I'm going back to you. In Psalms 51, he said, Lord, renew my spirit. Yeah. Don't take your Holy Ghost. All I'm telling you is, don't act like renewal is your choice. God is the one who lets you renew. You done done enough that God should not take you back. But he's standing right there to love you. Second point, you should renew. How do we get a revival? First point is, we renew our interest in God. Second point is, we make a new presentation or a new publication. So when something is renewed or something is revived, it's taking an old edition and making it a new edition. What am I trying to tell you? Crack open Get rid of those old prayers, your same old worship, same old praying, because you got some new stuff to face. Some of y'all don't realize that old stuff you're doing ain't going to get you out of your present dilemma. You got to know, I need a revival. What's the revival? I got to do a little bit more than I'm doing because what I did last year got me out of last year. But there's a whole lot of God I can get this year. Maybe I need to pray two times in the morning. Maybe I need to read right before I go to bed. Maybe I need to get up at lunchtime and take some lunch times off and just give God glory. I know I can't be with a crowd, but maybe I need to ride to a spot and just be with God. Right in the middle of all of this stuff. I'm, I want to tell y'all something right now. I'm getting ready to sneeze. Don't worry. It can't, oh, can't come through the projector. As much y'all know, I was going to do that. I'm sorry. But here's where we at. Let me, let me sanitize myself. All right. So what am I trying to tell you is we need to renew ourselves. What am I saying? Remember Hezekiah? Hezekiah was doing the will of God. Please let me emphasize doing the will of God. He was doing the will of God. And yet, right after he uh, defeated the Assyrians by prayer, God sent Isaiah to him and said, Hezekiah, I know you've been doing a whole lot of stuff, but get your house in order. You're about to die. And, I, and Hezekiah, Hezekiah could have gave up. He could have started whining like some of us do. But he decided to step up his game. You know what he did? He said, now, I'm a good man. I've been praying. I've been talking. Nobody else been serving God. He said, but right now, I'm getting ready to turn my face to the wall. You know what he said? I'm getting ready to go to a deeper level. I'm getting ready to go to a higher height. Some of y'all need to get you some new prayer going on. Some of y'all need to get you some new praise going on. You've been practicing the same scriptures for the last 10 years. you got a whole Bible with 66 books. Get you some new scriptures to walk around and meditate in. All I'm telling you is that if you don't understand, I can't be revived until I let God add on some stuff. This old stuff ain't working because I'm still falling apart. And the last way you revive, not only must you be renewed interest, not only must you republish yourself, you must also restore with force or trust God's strength. To republish means that God's mercy is with you. He allowed you to republish. But when you restore his strength, it means God's strength is with you. I love this one. Because here's how do we revive ourselves. Joseph had to revive himself. Every, he, was, he was God's man. But from the pit, he had to revive himself. Made it to Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house, he had to revive himself because he got into prison. He left the prison and he stood before fair. What I'm trying to tell you is the whole time... Joseph was being strengthened by God to revive himself. Please don't miss this point. If you survive something and get a chance to get a revival and get renewed, it's because God carried you through it. It's because of God's strength you're able to be here now. And that same strength ain't going nowhere today. You need to understand that God said you need a revival. And then he said, and he said, I was afraid. Look at the first verse. I was afraid. He said, I'm sorry I was afraid when I heard your voice. Your words were coming, but I was afraid. Listen to me. How in the world have you heard all this preaching and you read your Bible and yet you're still afraid because you heard the word, but you're not following the word? And if you don't follow the words, you can't get blessed. Okay, let me make a plan. Let me break it down for you. Uh, this couple went to the pastor because they wanted to get married. And when they went to the pastor to get married, the pastor informed them, I do premarital camps classes that are mandatory. And they went back to the pastor and they said, you must not understand, pastor. We don't need no premarital classes. Both of us have been married before. He's been married three times and I've been married five times. So we know what we're doing. No, you don't. Can somebody help me? How in the world do you think you know what you're doing if you've been married five times? There's some Christians just like it. You sitting around talking about, I know the word. I ain't got to listen to the preacher. I know what's going on. You be listening to preaching to critique somebody. You got to get some preaching on the inside of you. Because if things aren't working right, you sitting there talking about, I know. And just like that couple, you failing. 
They didn't even realize that they were failing because they did not follow the word. You know, you got to follow the word. Just can't take the word in. And following the word is not easy. Jesus was in temptation. And everything Jesus said was it is written. How you got rid of the devil? The word of God. David standing before Goliath said, you coming at me with a sword and a shield? I'm coming to you in the name of my God, Jehovah of the armies of Israel. His word. Um, I, I can keep going on. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had a cool word. You know what they said? They said, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to throw you in the fire. You know what they virtually said to Nebuchadnezzar? So what? Man, you a tough somebody when you can look the devil in the face and say, so what? No matter what you get ready to do to me. I, I thought about that, so what? And some of you who, who grew up like I grew up understand that we were younger. So what can be negative where it can be positive? When we were younger, we used to uh, go around and play the dozens. Now, I know I'm preaching now. Some of them will be very, you know, uh, coy and chaste with this. But I want you to understand there were the dozens. The dozens was when we would get together and crack on each other. Or we would talk about your mama. Yes, sir. I did not say your mama. Your mama is not in my neighborhood. Your mama lived in my neighborhood. So I'm telling you about your mama. And we would sit around and crack. Well, sometimes if you crack too hard on somebody about their mama, they was ready to fight. Let me give you an example. Now, I'm not going to get too bad. So when you get out mama, help me somebody, when somebody get the crack going, you sit there and get mad. Now, let me give you one. So somebody said, uh, your mama is so old, her social security number is one. Everybody start laughing, looking, but then somebody comes back and hit him hard. He said, okay, well, your mama so ugly that she make blind people cry. I'm just saying, y'all, I'm only using this for instance. I'm only, I'm only using this so I can give you an illustration. All I'm saying is that person then gets mad. He looks up and says, hey, so what? You better quit talking about my mama. And they want to fight. Second is this, is when somebody who know they're wrong and don't want to admit they're wrong. You have random kind of people that's always right. And when you catch them wrong, you know what they said, right? You show them the information. See what they said? They get like, like it ain't nothing now. So what? Uh, no, that's not what you said a minute ago. You was all up in my grill telling me you was right. There's some people that just can't accept when things are not right. That's not the that's not the kind of so what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the so what like the hero tied up in a chair and they get ready to torture him and uh, uh, like Denzel in Safe House. Uh, when he was Tobin Frost. Y'all remember how cool Denzel was? Denzel was sitting in the chair and they had him tied up. They were getting ready to waterboard Denzel. Y'all better check this. You know what Denzel did? Denzel was cool. He sat there. They started getting the towels out. He looked at him and he said, uh, uh, you need some 600s. He said, what are you talking about? 600 weight towels. You, them 350s ain't going to do nothing. Man. <clears throat> you need 600. Now he telling them how to torture him. Then they poured him back where it was hot. They put him back in that chair, poured a gallon of water over his face. You know what he did when he got up? Check the movie. When they got done, I said, uh, how long was that? Do you know what I'm talking about? That's the kind of soul what I'm talking about. When he looked at them and just said, how long was that? Or the best one is Sylvester Stallone in Rambo 2. When they got him chained up there in the Korean camp. And they shit an electric bolts through his body. They want him to make a broadcast saying that America had violated, uh, they were doing acts of terrorism. Report that you just violated the treaties and, and Sylvester Stallone wouldn't say anything. And they kept turning the electric up. And then they showed him how his own people had left him where he was. That's when they gave him that last shot. He said, I'll talk. Take me to the mic. And they got Sylvester Stallone over to the mic. He grabbed, y'all remember the scene, he grabbed hold of the base of that mic and he looked, they thought he was getting ready to squeal. He looked at the people that left him and said, I'm coming to get you. Then he turned around and beat everybody else up in the place. What am I telling you? What he said was, I'm coming to get you. I'm going somewhere. Don't think I done got off track. Some of y'all don't realize you got to tell the devil if you ever come in my house and start doing some stuff, you better know I'm coming after you. Have I got a witness? I'm going to do some praying. I'm going to do some hallelujah. I'm going to spread some oil. I'm going to lay some that devil. You mess with the wrong one. I don't care what you do. I'm coming after you. And I'm not even concerned how bad you try to make my life because I know my God is able. So we need to know that we need a revival. Secondly, in the text, you need a rehearsal. I'm almost done. This is not long. Verses 3 to 15. You need to rehearse. I mean, you got to rehearse. He started talking about how good God was. Habakkuk said, now I understand God 
So I know all this stuff is coming, but let me rehearse what's going on. Habakkuk said that uh, he used the word praise several times, and he used the word salah, selah, like they do in the Psalms, that there was a rest. Here's what he said. <clears throat> he said that I know I need to start rehearsing who God is, Amen. what he has done, and what he's capable of doing. If you ever want to get to the point that you know God is a, is a uh, even if God, you got to start rehearsing in your mind. And you first start off with some praise. Some of y'all don't realize you can't rehearse God without getting excited. You can't talk about God without having some praise in your heart. All I'm saying is, let me give you an example. When you see a Mercedes, you recognize it's a Mercedes because it got the Mercedes symbol on the hood. When you see a Louis Vuitton bag, you know that's Louis Vuitton when you see the initials on the bag. When you see Gucci or you see Coach or, you, or any a brand name, when you see the golden arches, you know that that's McDonald's because that's where I'm going. Well, here's what God said. How I recognize you as by the design. He said, I designed you to praise me. I can't even understand a child of God that never want to give praise. You were designed to say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. You were designed to say, I will bless the Lord at all times. You were designed to say, my God is worthy of the praise. How I don't even trust Christians that don't praise God. God said, you'll never understand me until you can praise me. You got to know who I am. Rehearse who I am. Who is God? There are three primary names in scripture for God. Write this down. The first one is Jehovah or Yahweh. That's when Moses in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, he went up to God and he went up to the mountain to see the burning bush. And when he came down, Moses said, who should I say sent me? And all of a sudden he said, tell him, I am who I am. I heard people say, I am that I am. That's not true. God is a who. He said, I am who I am. It meant Jehovah is the self-existent one. God said, I was here and nobody put me here. I'm so great that nobody knows where I'm going and there's no ending to me. I am Yahweh. The next word is Elohim. That means the strong-breasted one. These are the words for God, Elohim. And when you see Elohim, it means that he's working with his power. And the last word when you see God is Jehovah Yahweh. It's Elohim. Elohim. Here's the one God loves. It's Adonai. It's master. When you start, when you look, how many of y'all know when you really start thinking about how good God is? You don't need nobody around you. You just start worshiping him because he has blessed your soul. You got to lift your hands and say, master, because I know you're the one who's been controlling my life. So you got to know who he is. And God said, there is nobody else like me. I do. See, some people can't fathom who God is. This manufacturing company decided that they were going to go to a new company to get their product. And because of their standards, their, their, uh, what they call the standards of the company, they decided that they were going to send to this company, we will only take 1.5% in defective material. And they wrote that to the company. That meant that they wanted to make sure every order was at least 98.5% correct. Well, the company sent them two orders back. They sent them back one box was a big order, and they sent back a little order with this note. Why in the world would you want 1.5% defective material? We were prepared to do 100%, but since you asked for defects, that's what I gave you. Do you know God is sitting around saying, why in the world don't you expect more of me? Since you don't expect me to be able to get you out of that, since you don't know that I'm 100% God, since you don't know that I don't make any mistakes, you sitting there living in a situation you don't have to live in if you would just trust me. Hear what I'm saying? Some of y'all don't know there's nothing God can't do. There's nothing too great for God. There's nothing too hard for God. But you're sitting around saying, God, do this, but leave that alone because you don't believe he can do it. When God said, I'm ready to be 100%. Then you got to rehearse what he's done. I ain't got time to go there, but think back how he got you out. I asked everybody to put their personal testimony right there. Come on, because you know how bad you were. You know what he did in your life. And then finally, you got to rehearse what he's capable of doing. Two days ago, I got a call. From a young lady, bless me. I was, I was out walking. I was finishing up my sermon. And God dropped it right in my spot. The lady said, she said to me, said, Pastor, I just had to call and tell somebody. I said, what's going on? She said, I, I had gotten sick right before the coronavirus hit. I'm a single parent. And I work two jobs. One full-time, one part-time. And I'm barely making ends meet with my rent with my utilities, with my car, with my payments, and taking care of my children. She said, and you won't believe, right after I got sick, I'd already lost money, I went back to work, and when I got back to work, they laid me off. 
In her words, I went back to my house, laid across my bed, and started crying. She said, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to get through that. And then all of a sudden, she said, I got up, dried my eyes, and said, I'm just going to trust God. Yeah. She said, Pastor, I am happy to report to you. That was four weeks ago. I lost a full-time job. All I got is the part-time job. Y'all hear me now. I lost the full-time job. All I got is part-time job. No, she said, she said, out of all these four weeks, I ain't missed the rent payment. I ain't missed the car payment. I've been still buying groceries. Everything has been working in my life. She said, right now, I need you to know that if you, that right now, God has taken care of my need. Come on, that's something for somebody to shout about. Now, and she said, that's not really the shout. She said, the real thing is that I'm doing better now on a part-time job than I had two full-time jobs. And I think the difference is my God. Can somebody praise God? That it does not make a difference what you got. It's just learning to trust in the Lord. So you got to trust who he is. So you need to make sure that you rehearse God. I know Alan Iverson, you said practice. Yeah, Alan Iverson, practice. I love Alan. Don't get me mess with man. But you need to practice. Choirs sing better when they practice. Musicians play better when they practice. Athletes do better when they rehearse. You got to know that if you don't practice God, that's why you're defeated. Last point. Habakkuk was going by. He was now singing praise to God. And he got to the point and said, I understand now, God. Not only must you have a revival, must you rehearse, you must recommit. Look at verse 16. When I heard all you were going to do, I trembled. My lips quivered. My voice, rottenness entered my bones. <clears throat> he said, here's what God is telling me to do. If you're going to prepare for him to be an even if God, no trouble is coming and don't be afraid of it. Here's what he said. First, I got to understand trouble is coming. Lord, I know it's going to be a multitude of trouble. So I realize now, God, that I don't have to worry about the trouble coming because it will come. Then he said this. But even if it comes, well, let me back up and say this. Please prepare yourself for something. You ain't had no bad times. It may come. Quit being one of those kind of guys that think God only, one of those kind of Christians that think God only bless you if things are right. Watch this. He said, although the fig tree doesn't blossom, neither shall the fruit in the vine. And later, here's what he said. Even if, can you put your even if there? Even if I get sick, God is a healer. Yeah. Yeah. Even if I go broke, God supply my needs. Even if I start losing my mind, God will give me a mind of peace. Even if they try to take my house, God said, not worry about what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink, where I'm going to live. What I'm... Can I talk to somebody right now? Even if all I got to do is recommit myself to God and realize that my God will bring me out no matter what. Even if everything else falls apart, my God will bless me. And then he went further. He said, I'm just going to tell life from this point on, so what? Y'all be taking me out now. So what? Can I get somebody to just practice that? I'm, I'm not saying be reckless with it. I gave you the right ring for so what. You got to stand like a hero under torture saying, so what? I'm sick, so what? I got to die. We hear me go through? So what? My God is with me. Know what he said? I'll go further than so what? I'm going to turn into a rejoicer. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, rejoice in the Lord always. I love this part. Make sure that you rejoice in the Lord always and then undergird it. Pray without ceasing. Can't rejoice if you don't pray. And then he said, for this is the will of God concerning you. I believe that if the worst thing in my life comes to pass, my God Got me. He going to catch me when I fall. I'm closing now, but I need somebody to know. His hands are the only hands that are big enough to hold you. Come on, you got your own story. You know stuff that we don't even know about you. Maybe a tear comes to your eye when you think about that night, that day when you almost gave up. And somehow, the Lord said not so. Save your child. Save your job. Provide it for you when you didn't know how. Can I ask you to become that Christian to say, even if God's got my back. Yes, Lord. 
I thank God for Abaka. Abaka had to learn the hard way. He is a good God. And no matter what he allows, he will get us out. There's somebody out there today. You need an even if God. It's going to happen. Something is going to come your way. Can you pray with me today? Wherever you are. And realize that there is a God who keeps our head up. Keeps us laughing and confident. Because we know even if the worst happens. If nothing goes right. I got an on time God. So right now I want you to repeat these words after me. Pray this prayer with me. Say it loud. Say Lord God. I am a sinner. I know, God, that you died for my sins. I could not pay the price. But, Lord, I'm tired. I need strength. I've tried so many other things. And now I want to try you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And you rose again with all power in your hand. Because I believe it. And confess and say this now. I am saved. Oh, somebody ought to give God some joy right there. If you pray that prayer, your life is about to change because now you're in the hands of the even if God. Don't forget, Wednesday, we're live Bible study. Next Sunday, we'll get blessed as the word of God comes to us. This is Pastor Duncan saying thanks for joining us. God bless you. And don't forget to write in for your book. Have a great day. I was down, but with a no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.